Well, we are going to be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 29 today. Thank you, brother. So please start making your way there for this morning. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 29 for this morning. As you're going there, I will begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord God, I thank you so much just for this day, Lord. I thank you for the privilege it is to have the little ones up here on the, the step to hear those different catechism questions, Lord, that I would ask that you would help us as the adults in this room too, Lord, hear those truths of your word. Lord, as we come come here to Galatians chapter 3, Lord, help us remind ourselves of what has taken place thus far in your word. Help us recall the advice, the commands, the rebukes from Paul to the churches of Galatia. And Lord, I would ask that today you would help us seek out the 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 truth here, Lord. It is right here before us. Help us implement and apply them correctly in our lives. And may we live a, a more holy life today than what we did yesterday as we are be, being conformed to your image. Lord, grant these things to us today according to your will. And we ask this in your name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So let us go ahead and read Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 29 for today. Let's read this. It says this. Therefore, the law has become, a, has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now, faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ... Have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to promise. Let's go ahead and pray over this text again before we examine and look more into what this has for us. Lord, I, I again, I thank you so much, Lord, for the realization that it is not I, it is not us, it is not any individual in here that could obtain salvation through our actions, through our motives, through the works that we would do, Lord, but it is through Christ alone and faith alone and grace alone that we have any opportunity to be before you, Lord. And so, God, we thank you for what Christ has secured in our place God, I would ask that you would remind us of those things that we would not look to law to justify ourselves, but we would look to Christ. Lord, because if anyone dies in here looking to the law, looking to actions, looking to their hands, Lord, they will surely go to hell for all eternity. So, Lord, I ask that today we would celebrate the salvation that we have in Jesus the Christ, that we better understand what the law was, what the law is, and that we would understand what Paul is getting at here in Galatians chapter 3. And we ask this in your mighty name, the man of sorrow. Amen. Last week, we gave a title to today's message that we used last week, but we're going to be using again today. And that is the complexity of simplicity. And I want to first begin by giving us a little bit of context of what is going on here again. This letter is written by the Apostle Paul to the churches, plural, of Galatia. And these churches of Galatia were made mostly of Gentile people. And this letter of Paul to the churches of Galatia is specifically rebuking the false teachers that had infiltrated the churches in that day, which were the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were convincing these churches of Galatia, these Gentile peoples, to forsake grace alone and faith alone and Christ alone by giving them a knife and giving them the law of Moses saying, here, this is what it means to be truly a Christian. If you want to become truly Christian like we, the Judaizers, we, the Jews are, you must do X, Y, or Z things. And that is the, the whole premise of why Paul is writing this letter. That if any man comes to you and preaches to you a gospel other than the one that you have yet received, let him be cut off. Let him be accursed. That knife that they give you you take that knife and you say, be gone. I'm cutting you off because of what you are teaching. And so today's title again is The Complexity of Simplicity, Part 2, really expanding and jumping off from what we talked on last week. 
And the point of that, again, just as a reminder, is that the message of salvation in the Lord alone, salvation is of the Lord, is a very simple message. Being saved in Christ is a simple message, but the means of how God's redemptive plan within history is a very complex system, a very complex means that has brought us about that simple message. The, the, to receive the message of salvation is, of Jesus alone is simple. It is through faith. But the complex orchestration of salvation is intricately and divinely planned by God. So salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, it, again, is a very simple message. However, the number of secondary causes that came about in and through time in and through God's sovereign plan, God's predestination should really cause us to marvel. And that is what I, I want us to do today is my desire for us is, again, to celebrate the salvation that we have in Christ, but to marvel and to glorify our God who has loved us in such a marvelous and grand way. Galatians 4, four. if you want to read this with me, I, I would appreciate it. It says this, but when the fullness of time came... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Christ came at the fullness of time. He did not come in the garden right after Adam had sinned. He did not come in the days of Cain when he murdered his brother, nor in the days of when Joseph was sold into slavery. Not when Moses led Israel out of captivity and not in the days of the building of the second temple there in Jerusalem. But the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came at the Father's appointed time. He lived a perfect life under wicked rulers like Herod and Pontius Pilate. He was condemned by the people of Israel who sought out the release of a murderer instead of the innocent Lamb of God. And he was crucified by the Gentile Roman soldiers who mocked and pierced our Savior. You have to ask yourself this. What was necessary to take place in order for the seed of Abraham, who is the Christ, to come at the fullness of time? What was necessary? What was the leading up events that brought about the Christ? And I'm not just talking about those 33 years of Christ's life. I'm talking about all of history. What was necessary to bring about Jesus. Because Paul is addressing those, those complex different means that we see there in the Old Testament that we read about. Paul is addressing those means that brought about Christ. The same means, the exact same means that the Judaizers were trying to twist and abuse to turn it into a works-based salvation, which undermines the need and sufficiency of Christ in the first place. This morning I was... I was I, I don't know why I brought it over with me. I was working on a Zippo lighter and I grabbed out my Zippo lighter and I, I flicked it and the flame wouldn't turn on for me. And I was like, why is the flame not working? And so I poured a whole bunch of, of lighter fluid in it, trying to get it to work. But then I realized that there was no flint that was touching the steel in order to get it done. So then I had to replace the flint. But then guess what else I knew to notice? The, the wick inside my Zippo lighter wasn't good, so I had to pull out a new strand of my, my stuff. The point of it is, is that the flame itself, the thing that I desired when I first pulled out my lighter was a simple thing. It's what the whole point of the lighter's purpose is. But it wouldn't work. The flame would not come about if there was not these different means within this lighter. Christ Jesus, again, did not come right there in the garden and defeat Satan. When he led the children of Israel out of captivity from Egypt, he did not defeat Satan in those things. When does this take place? In Jesus Christ dying on the cross and rising again on the third day. It came about through a complex different systems of means and, and these things were necessary in order to bring about the Christ. So again, Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time came. So understanding that Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 to 29 is before chapter 4 verse 4. Paul is addressing and telling us this is how the fullness of times came. 
So before we jump right into the text, before we start looking at verse 24 and seeing what all these different things mean, I want to remind ourselves of what we talked about last week. There are two running themes that are taking place in this text, and these two running themes are covenants and law. First, I want to remind ourselves of what we defined covenants as last week's. We will continue to utilize the definition of the broad use of covenants given by a gentleman named Dr. Robert Martin, uh, a theologian who died in 2016. He again, he boils down all these different uh, definitions given for covenants and he gives a very simple, very simplistic definitions of covenants, which is this, an oath made with a promise. He argues that covenants in the very basic rudimentary form is an oath made with a promise. And as mentioned last week, Though this definition is broad enough to cover the complex and complete usage of covenants in all of the Bible, it lacks the differences and the uniquenesses of varying covenants therein. When it comes to the covenants of works in the Old Testament, when it comes to those, those huge major events there in the Old Testament, we could further define the covenants of old as this. Divinely imposed oaths, that consisted of required obedience. That's where it gets the name covenants of works. It also included curses, promises, blessings, signs, and sometimes even meals. Meals that took place within those covenants. When it comes to the covenant of grace, the covenant that we talk about often here on Sunday, we could define this as, and this would come from Hebrews chapter 8, the divinely imposed and accomplished better oath enacted on better promises that were earned through the mediation of Christ alone and freely given to the members of his body. And therefore, this covenant or this oath has no required obedience, which means no curses for its members, thus making it a true covenant of grace. This covenant of grace, again, has a sign, which is baptism. That's according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, which we are going to see here in a moment. It says, and therefore, all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. This covenant also has a meal, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. This covenant of grace demonstrates the doctrines of grace, that beautiful doctrine that we talked about all the time in church, as it involves the redemption of depraved man mediated unconditionally on behalf of its limited or particular membership. And this covenant status cannot be lost because you were not the one that earned this covenant status of grace. And therefore, if you are a member, you persevere as saints unto God. I say all this as I desire you and I not to smash the covenants found in the Bible, each and every one of them, into a plateau, thus flattening them out with no distinguishing features about them. Because even Paul here in, in Galatians chapter 3, he's referencing a covenant made with Abraham. And then he's referencing something that came 430 years later that was not in, in place, that was not implemented during those 430 years. For this, for this purpose, I want to now talk about the law because we were mentioning that covenant that was made with Moses. What is the law that came 430 years later? I want to read Galatians chapter 3 verse 17 through 19 says this, and what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to abolish the promise. For if inheritance is by law, it is no longer by promise, but God granted it to Abraham through promise. Why the law then? Why the law then? Paul automatically knows that this question is going to be asked. Why the law then? The very law, and I want to pause here, the very law that the Judaizers are telling the churches of Galatia, follow this. If you want to be a Christian, you must follow this Mosaic law. According to Acts chapter 15, it is a burden, a yoke that not no one, not the fathers, nor they in the first century were able to obey. That they were able to keep in a way that would justify them before, the, before our mighty God. So Paul says, why the law then? It was added because of trespasses, having been ordained through hands by the angels, ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator until, and I want you to really mark that because that's going to be a major theme in the rest of this chapter and the beginning of chapter four, 
until the seed. The law that was given 430 years later was added because of transgressions, and it was until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So this law that we're going to be speaking of today had a purpose. It had a time. It had a means, and it brought about Christ Jesus. Let's go ahead and read Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7, a text that we'll be exploring next week. But just to see where we're going in the text, it says this. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from, from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and stewards. I want to pause there. What do you think guardians and stewards are talking about in here? It's talking about that law that came 430 years later. Until, so again, you see that word, until the date set by the Father. So also, while we, while we were children, were enslaved under the elemental things of the world, but when the fullness of time came, the text that we read earlier, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, talking to this church of Galatia, these churches, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The law of Moses, which consisted of ceremonies and judicial laws, governances, was not given to Adam, uh, not to, uh, given to Adam, not given to Abraham, not given to Moabites, not given to Canaanites, not given to people in Asia, not given to the Native Americans in the United States, or any other people group other than guess who? Moses and Israel. It had a border to it. The Judaizers were taking those ceremonial and judicial laws, and they were twisting them into a yoke of slavery for the church. It should be noted that the law of Moses required obedience that existed within the Mosaic Covenant that granted the blessing of going into the land and living within that promise. Living within that promised land. So now with that in mind, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 24 through 26, and let's read this. It says this, Therefore the law has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come... We are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Something that we've talked on over and over and over again, especially from chapter 2, which says in there that we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. How is one justified? Through having faith in Jesus Christ, and he declares us legally righteous before him. He sees the righteousness of Christ, that act of obedience that Christ has earned on our account and has transmitted and imposed and imputed upon us is what he sees. We were bought with a price. The law, so we understand that we are justified through faith in Christ. But these laws of Moses, which was the judicial and ceremonial laws that were given to the ethnic, physical people of Israel, came about 430 years later after Abraham. These laws are recorded for us in what's known as the Torah and the Pentateuch, which are the first five Bible, books in our Bible. I think it's helpful whenever we think about this, when, when we think about reading God's word, sometimes it's very helpful, and I think it's often very helpful to put yourself in the shoes of who it was first written to and why it was written. Very important for context and hermeneutics. Put yourself there in the shoes of the Israelites who are about to go into the land. About to go into the land that they're... Their, their father Abraham, through oral traditions, you've heard about this land, you're hoping for this land, you're wanting this land, and here comes Moses writing these books for us. What would you as an Israelite in those days learn from those first five books, and namely from the book of Genesis? 
These, this is the only scripture you have. You can't open up to the book of Galatians. You can't do any of that. You have those first five books in the Bible. You would undoubtedly notice how God has been working through the means of covenants. You would understand that God has been giving oaths and promises and that there was required obedience. Adam, do not eat of this tree. Abraham, walk and be perfect. So you would understand all these, these different covenants that are going on there. You'd also be aware of those seed promises that, that, that a seed was going to come and crush the head of the serpent, that there was a seed of Abraham that would bless the nations. But there is one major theme that sometimes is often overlooked by people when we read this. And that is the spread of sin since the beginning. You would notice the depressing theme that has found its way throughout all of humanity, which is that spread of sin. You would read about your first parents' fall that excluded them from the garden. You would recognize the jealousy and the murderous tendencies and actions of Cain that resulted in his rejection. You would read of the depravity of every human's continual thoughts and their heart that grieve the heart of our, our Lord Yahweh enough to wipe them off the whole earth except for Noah and his family. You would read of the sexual immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah and how only Lot and his family escaped that city's destruction. You, you would recognize sin on every single page of those first five books from Moses. Dr. Robert Gonzalez, the dean of Reformed Baptist Seminary, notes that at this point, the Israelites hearing these words recorded by Moses would result in this conclusion. The collective and societal sins increasing and mounting to the point where God can no longer extend forbearance. This ominous portrayal serves to continue the spread of sin theme found there early in God's word. So, you then, as an Israelite, are standing there, and you understand this, but you're thinking to yourself, well, what about Abraham, our father of the faith? What about Abraham, our father? Was this not our father who bore a, a, a son through the old barren woman, Sarah? What about Abraham? Was Abraham without sin? Immediately following Abraham receiving this covenant of God that we've talked about extensively in Genesis 15, Abraham attempts to produce a natural seed through an adulterous relationship with Hagar outside of the promise of God. The Israelites would read sin after sin that came about even after the days of Abraham, even in the days of Abraham. You would read about all the sins that have plagued your family and your lineage for the last 400 years that even God told Abraham would take place there in Genesis 15. What was needed for that nation of Israel? What was the needed thing that needed to come about that was needed to be given to them to protect the promise of the seed that would come and crush the head of the serpent and bless the nations? They needed additional laws. Let's see what Paul's word used to describe these laws of Moses. And we've already read them. Verse 23 from chapter 3 says this. It tells us that it was a jail. Verse 24 and 25 call it our tutor. And chapter 4 verse 2 calls and says that it was a guardian and a steward. So we have several names given to us that the law was the law of Moses that came 430 years later. A jail, tutor, and a steward and guardian. Because of these names that are given to the law of Moses, I wish to give us just three short analogies. And I would ask you to please not take these analogies too far. Just, just understand the basic upfront meaning of these analogies. So first, put yourself in the shoes of a father who has children. And he's given these children general law. Law that applies to all of them equally throughout time. He says... You have to eat your vegetables, you have to listen to my voice, and you have to go to bed before 9, 9, 9 p.m., not 9 a.m., 9 p.m. However, one day, a murderer breaks into your house in an attempt to kill your children. What would you do? Is, it, is that law that you've already given them sufficient to protect them? Eat your vegetables, go to bed before 9, and listen to my voice. Is that sufficient to protect them from this murderer? 
No. You would give them new specific law that might seem harsh to them. You would say, go in the closet, hide, and don't come out until I tell you it's safe to. So what should they do? They should go and listen to your voice. They go and they hide in the closet and they are under this new law. Don't come out until I tell you it's safe to. What does the father proceed to go do? He goes and kills that murderer. He takes care of that person that has come into his house. And he goes back to his children and he says, what? Come out. This is how the law of Moses was a guardian to the nation of Israel. It protected that promised seed of Christ. After Jesus has crushed the head of the serpent, that murderous intruder, from the beginning, there is no more need for that specific law that kept the nation behind a closed door. That's the first analogy. Second analogy. Imagine again you are a parent of children. Sin has spread in your house and your oldest daughter that you love oh so dearly has become addicted to heroin because of peer pressure. Because your dear love for your daughter, you lock her in a room where she goes through withdrawals and all, all while not permitting her to see her supposed friends. That's a very loving action to do of as a father, right? If your daughter, who is 15, 16 years old, is addicted to heroin, sometimes you have to be harsh in the way you treat her. Should you let her go hang out with her friends anymore? No. It's not going to be a pretty thing, but you need to let her withdraw from heroin. This is how the law of Moses... Was that a law that was always there for this daughter? Well, no, because she wasn't addicted to heroin all her life. You had to give her new law because it was a new part of the, the time that had come about on her. And this is how the law of Moses was a jail master. Though those laws were given unto Israel with deathly penalties of disobeyed, it was meant to keep them from pagan influence that would destroy the promise of the Christ. One of the reasons that those laws were given to the nation of Israel was to protect them from the pagans. To protect them from outside influences that would destroy them inside. So again, we're going to look at one more analogy. Imagine you are a teacher of a child that has been promised, that God has promised you would be a master and expert in math. Yet while he is in fifth grade, he still does not know multiplication or division. You most likely would give him more and more schoolwork while also spending extra time one-on-one -on -one with him in hopes that one day his genius would kick in. This is how the law of Moses was like a tutor unto the nation of Israel. It reminds them of their continual failures and inability to meet the standards of God. Thus, when Jesus came and fulfilled all the demands of the law perfectly, it was undeniable who the Christ was. And the promise of God had not failed. So with those three things in our mind, let's read again. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. It says this, Therefore the law has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The Judaizers, again, were arguing that these laws of Moses which verse 19 tells us was until the seed, they would twist the purposes of them to, to something it could not do, which was justify us. Those laws of old could not justify us. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law. Those Judaizers also extended the law past its proper time. When was the law and its proper time ended? Until Christ. As mentioned last week, one of the secondary good news of us being in Christ is, guess what? We can eat bacon in it now. We can come here with different clothes that are mixed together and we don't have to suffer the penalties that were given to the nation of Israel. Why? Because those laws were until Christ. I want to read with you Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4 through 13, if you wouldn't mind turning there with me.
Because Hebrews 8 is talking about Moses and Galatians 3 is talking about the law of Moses. Let's just see how Paul now speaks in Hebrews chapter 8, who I think is the author of Hebrews. It says this, verse 4 through 13 in Hebrews chapter 8, it says this, Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. What law is that talking about? Those ceremonial laws that were given to Israel 430 years later. Who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the temple. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says. So pause there and just let's look at this. Why was there fault in that covenant made with Moses? Because man was involved with it. The fault was there because there was required obedience. And do you think anyone could re would be able to maintain that required obedience? No, except for one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was there ceremonial sacrifices that were to be given? Was because there was sin that was being committed. These laws, these covenant of old was full of fault because mankind was involved with them. So because of that, there was an occasion that was sought because of the fault that was committed in those first covenants. And so therefore, Paul then writes this, which is a quotation from Jeremiah 31. He says, for finding fault with them, he says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will complete or cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. For, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and upon their hearts I will write them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Brothers and sisters, do you and I live in the Mosaic Covenant. Praise the Lord we don't. Because it, it was full of fault. Do we live in the days of the covenant of grace? Have we been saved by this grace that is talked about? Is there forgiveness of sins? Absolutely. And that is in Christ Jesus, that mediator of this new covenant. Something that I find absolutely remarkable from Galatians to Hebrews when we consider these things is the righteousness that Christ has obtained for us. You think about all that heaping on of law that was done upon those people of old that we continually, humanity continually fell short of that standard of God. That standard that is like the Mount Everest, it's insurmountable for by you and I, that standard is now upon us, fulfilled through Christ Jesus. Jesus fulfilled every one of those heapings of different laws that were put upon the nation of Israel and put upon man generally. Yet we, you and I, stand righteous as God as if we had kept all of those laws perfectly because Christ Jesus kept them perfectly. Turn back with me now to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 now. So we understand it's not through our keeping of the law. Because first of all, we couldn't keep the law. 
Second of all, the, that law that the, the Judaizers were trying to use as a, a yoke of slavery for you and I, for Gentiles, Paul says that's applying the law wrongly and it's applying it past its time that it was until. Paul tells us we're justified by faith. Just as Abraham in the prior text, as we've seen, Abraham was justified by faith. Let's now read verse 27. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. This verse makes so much sense why Paul is saying it here when we first consider how Paul is speaking of covenants in this text. And how the Judaizers were taking the signs of those old covenants, circumcision namely, and saying this is how you become a Christian, is through circumcision. What is Paul arguing about? He's arguing that now that you are in Christ, now that you've been justified by him, now you take the sign of that covenant, which is baptism. Paul is telling the churches to remember the sign of the covenant that they are in. The covenant of grace that we've just read about in Hebrews chapter 8. Paul, who is most likely, Paul is the one who planted these churches of Galatia. And who do you think most likely baptized the people here in those churches? Most likely it was Paul himself. Or he at least was involved with the baptisms in one way or another. And so baptism in our culture has lost so much meaning, brothers and sisters. Why? Because when you and I are baptized... The world only scoffs at what we're doing. What was it to be baptized in those days, in the first century? It was like signing a death warrant and asking for persecution in the world. Because that's where everybody saw, oh, so you're no longer saying you're a Jew, you're a Christian now? You're no longer saying that you follow after the gods of Rome. You're actually saying that Jesus is God and that you've died with him, that you've been buried with him and that you've rose again. This baptism... You're going to die on this. There were people who died because of their baptism. It was a serious thing that sometimes we can overlook in the United States in the year of 2024, where again, only culture most likely will do is scoff at you when you're baptized. So Paul is telling them to look at that deep conviction of the gospel, the life, death, burial, and resurrection, which was the sign of baptism, the sign of this covenant that they have entered into through faith when they are actively putting on Christ in a world that hates them. The Judaizers who were arguing that the Gentiles must remove their flesh, remove that flesh, Paul's reminding them that they have put on Christ. What's remarkable about this, I think, again, is is Paul says, if you think that righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So Paul is saying, if you remove flesh in order to think that you are saved, you have never been covered by Christ in the first place. If you've taken the sign of the covenant, you have publicly proclaimed that Christ is covering you. It is a sign that you've been undeservingly saved through the sufficient work of Christ Jesus himself. So it makes sense why Paul is talking about the sign of baptism in this language of covenants, because what do covenants often have? Signs of covenants. Let's go ahead and read verse 28. It says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Again, the Judaizers taught that there was a distinction between Jew and Gentile. And beloved church, this teaching that there is a distinction between Jew and Gentile flies in the face of all of Scripture. The view that says that there are two people of God is opposed to the gospel message itself. It's the very message that the Judaizers were proselytizing amongst the churches there in the first century. And it just so happens that the distinction of Jew and Gentile is the bedrock of so many heresies of today. This is readily seen within, guess what, modern day Judaism. It's readily seen in the Hebrew Roots movement. It's readily seen in the black Hebrew Israelites movement. It's readily seen in Islam and even in the Seventh-day Advent churches teaching that there is a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Let's look at what Galatians 4, 7, it says this. 
Therefore, you are no longer a slave. Which the churches of Galatia would have been hearing this kind of language because there in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, I am a Jew by nature and not a Gentile among sinners. And Paul is using the language that the Judaizers are using in there. And so the Judaizers are saying, no, you're a slave and you're a sinner. You're not like us, the Jews, who are the true children of God. And Paul's telling us, no, you are no longer a slave. You're a child of God. You're an heir because he has adopted you. So just imagine you're in a room with a father and two sons. And one of those sons is a natural offspring, a natural child. And the other son is an adopted one. And you hear as you're sitting in this room watching this father and these two sons, you hear the father look at both of his sons and he says, I love you both and you both are my sons. No matter what anyone thinks or says about it, you are my children. Imagine if that father walked out of the room and you heard the natural born offspring go up to his adopted brother and say, he's a liar. I'm the true son. You're not like me. We would all look at that and say, that's injustice. You're going against the words of what the father has told you. You're proclaiming something that's not true that the father has distinguishedly said and unapologetically said to them, you are both my children. Church, if God has called us, Jews and Gentiles, those that have faith in Christ, if He has called us the people of God, if He has called us Jews by regeneration from Romans 2.29, if He calls us children, what are you to consider yourself? Exactly what God has called you. Stop playing with the words the world tries to proselytize to us like the Judaizers were trying to do. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile if you are in Christ Jesus. Now this is talking, of course, about salvation. It's not like we believe when a woman or a man comes to Christ, they're no longer women and men. No, it's just saying that there's no distinction in your, per, in your, in, uh, your, your value in Christ. You have come to one that has made you clean undeservingly. So with this in mind, listen to the words here in verse 29. The last verse of this chapter, it says this. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to promise. Heirs according to promise. Who is the seed of Abraham that has already been told to us here in the text? It says that Christ is that seed. Not seeds is referring to plural, but seed meaning Christ, singular. Jesus is the offspring of Abraham. He is the promised seed that would come and bless the nations. He is the promised seed that surely destroyed and crushed the head of the serpent from old. And because there is no Jew, nor Greek, there is no slave, nor free man, there is no male and female. And if we are in Christ, we are part of the body of Christ. What does Paul then tell us? You are heirs of Abraham according to promise. You are heirs of Abraham according to promise. Paul has already made the assertion that being seeds is not one of plural, but being in Christ, he now says, this is how you're made the true children of the faith, is if Christ died for you. If you are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 16. If you'd like to turn with me there, this is where we're going to be concluding. Hebrew, or Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 11 through 16. Hebrew, or no, I keep on saying Hebrews, excuse me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 16 says this. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by the so called circumcision, who are called uncircumcised, or which is performed in the flesh by human hands, 
Remember that you were at that time without Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. The covenants, plural, of promise, singular. Having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace who made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall of partition by abolishing in His flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in Himself we, He might create the two into one new man making peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross having in Himself put to death the enmity. I think the conclusion in all these things that we've looked at today and what we saw last week is this. Through faith alone, we are united to Christ, the seed of Abraham, and made heirs of the promise. And though this simplicity of our salvation is a marvel, the depth of what Christ has accomplished should leave us in awe. Worship our mighty God today, who has brought about the most beautiful and complex redemptive plan. And I beg you to look at the stars tonight when it gets dark outside. And remember that they are the exact same stars that Abraham once gazed upon. And glorify our mighty triune God, because if you have placed faith in Jesus, that singular seed, then in Jesus you are a fulfillment of Abraham and what he was staring at that night. Heirs of the promise. The complexity of simplicity. Faith alone in Christ alone is a simple message. But it came about through a complex, redemptive, historical plan that God himself has brought about. Let us pray and marvel. Lord, I thank you so much for what you have done, what you have brought about in Christ Jesus, something that none of us in this room, none of us in all of history could ever accomplish, which was the, the perfect righteous life. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who existed in the form of God and not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond slave, a bond servant being made under the law, being put to death, even death upon a cross. Lord, you have exalted the name of Christ above all other names, and it is upon that name today that we come to worship you, and it's upon that name we come justified before you. So Lord, help us bow our knee today and worship to our mighty King, Jesus the Christ. And it is upon that name, Jesus the Christ, our King, we ask this. Amen.